Hey, Lindsay. Hi. So, guys, Lindsay is my sister from another mister. You'll get to discover for yourself um, the nature of Lindsay and where her mind is at. She teaches English, literature, critical thinking, that it will empower students to help for them to basically project their personal views and give them a sense of community. She's also a poet. Thank you so much, Tanika. It has been super special how we've connected. Um, and I'm really excited to be on this journey with you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining me. Today is about beauty, but not just about beauty, the beauty industry, beauty cosmetics, how it's been a virus and just infected the minds, the souls of our psyches and our overall nature all over the globe, right? Mm. When it comes to anywhere in the world where you have seen the atrocity of white supremacy flooded mm. beauty, where would you pinpoint? Um, all right. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been somewhere where I've not seen it. Um, although I've been in spaces and share a community where I feel that people are with awareness very much rejecting those European beauty standards and that colonial influence. Um, uh, very much a shout out to Oakland, California, where I've been able to spend a lot of time and um, have a lot of dear friendships. And I think that um, I've been educated by community and friends there and bared witness to seeing them reject a lot of those um, uh, colonial and European beauty standards. So that's that's what I think gives me a lot of insight into what it looks like to uh, build that awareness and uh, fuel that rejection and, and reclaim one's beauty. And, and then in spaces where I, I don't see that happening or I see a lot of that um, European and colonial beauty standards still in my face um i think you know so for sure in the states when we think about media magazines images that are marketed to us absolutely uh we still have a lot of over representation of european beauty standards thinness uh whiteness paleness blonde hair blue eyes absolutely that a lot of those images still dominate the market and you know, we can talk mo more about how that's changing and also where it's genuine and where it's disingenuine. Uh, I'm living in China now, and certainly a lot of the advertising here, and so I've been able to travel to the Philippines since I've been here. I, I see a lot of the same marketing, a uh, major emphasis on, on European women and uh, your light skin tones, pale skin tones, um, light hair and eyes. And while that, while certainly the society and people do with that influence as they will, and each person's gonna be individual and not everyone's gonna be impacted the same way, those, those marketing strategies and those images are still really present. I think there's an overwhelming amount of European representation in in images of beauty. Yeah, because I remember when I was in China, it was difficult to not basically find a job for a particular look, which was typically Russian, Ukrainian, pale faced, uh, slim. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was kind of just like, wow, like this was like for properties, for jobs, um, on billboards, for media advertisements. And it's like everywhere my head turned, it was just like, blatant that there was just a, a strong eurocentric influence and one thing i did also notice when i was in china as well and i think when we were speaking we mentioned this so it was the eyelids weren't it um so the strips that make your eyelids bigger to make it more wide like a european right the fact that those those beauty tools even exist and who's profiting from them who's marketing them and who's who's making them physically making them yeah yeah because I know like when we think about white supremacy um, and how European beauty standards came about, it was just this whole obsession with skin lightening. Mm -hmm. And at first, you know, whitening agents were actually used on white women to obviously immaculate their beauty. Mm. And during the Jim Crow laws, that's when they passed it. It became really like popular amongst the black community because it was their way of feeling accepted. It was their survival toolkit. The whiter your skin is, 
it means that you have power and you have privilege. As if that's not enough colorism. Do you know what they were doing at one point as well um, when they were trying to cast people for Bollywood? Employing uh, Eu European women that had Indian features to take their role. Great. I saw a film depicting, it was colonial, uh, colonial occupation of India. And they had, they had European actors and actresses and they had make up to their face to represent Indian people. And I was, I had not seen, obviously this film is from the fifties, um, maybe a little earlier, but I had not seen something like that so overt, but you know, I think there, we do have, we have a lot of uh, those types of issues even in current day for sure. And so we see that like whitewashing of uh, a lot of different ethnic groups in Hollywood for sure. You made me think of so many things. <laughs> even, uh, one of my best friends, uh, she and I love makeup and uh, it always sparks a lot of uh, in-depth critical conversation between us um, and one one of the words that's been a major buzzword in makeup in maybe in the last five years is brightening yes and brightening in our conversation we've we've tried to break down does it mean whitening mm. and what is the intention of the the makeup company I think it's i think there's a lot there uh around what what we're actually saying and what does it mean to brighten a complexion um does it mean glow does it mean highlight or does it mean whitening and i and i think that it's it's arguable in a lot of directions i was just rereading um uh tahisi coates has a, a piece I can, we can link things later. I, I was doing a little bit of reading before we met and it was, it was an excerpt from, from some writing, um, probably early 1900s, talking about how, because of how pale the brow of the woman was, that it, it would be impossible for her to have an impure thought. And so even this aligning of whiteness, paleness with morality and, and religious purity is a really violent and lasting, I think that's majorly part of that colonial impact that we still see today and the way that people align themselves consciously and subconsciously. I watch over a lot of the, the Disney movies that I watched as a kid and other influences and it's constantly urging us to to uphold those European beauty standards. I've seen brands here like, and I'll just put them on blast, uh, Palmer's, they do like a cocoa butter. And I saw, it's, I've seen it a lot in the US. Um, Walgreens will have it, CVS, things like that. But here I saw Palmer's edition that, that had the word whitening on it. And I was like, Ooh, and I don't know the names per se of people who own these companies, but well, I imagine I'll give you one. Uh, mm -hmm. you know Unilever. Mm -mm. Okay, so they're actually owned by I believe it's Dove. Okay, a lot of these companies, Unilever especially, it's been known to have the most dangerous, harmful chemicals. But the mm. thing is, what they will argue is. You know, it's it's popular customer demand. I imagine in in parts of the U.S. now there's more demand for natural products, and certainly we see more support. I hope more support socially, and soon uh, legally, governmentally, um, systemically support for women's natural hair, for black women's natural hair and, and in the workplace and in school and, and these kinds of things. I hope that there is more education that's happening about that now. And I hope that it also, one for sure, I'd love to see all of those products be black owned, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, And I think that that's something that with 
uh, more awareness of black economy and more effort to to buy black, at least in the U.S. I hope that that's the trajectory of of that business and um, that business industry. And I was thinking, too, that especially if black community and black economy is profiting. I'm sure there's a lot of women who are are very aware of the controversy, controversial controversy of um, all these different perspectives on black women's hair and and how they style their hair and things like that. And who might still then choose to have hair extensions or something like that, like you're saying. Mm. So I've got things here written down. Mm. Extra white, long lasting, fair, even skin. Become white in seconds. And then um, there's something called Miss White product, which says, which is labeled whiter skin in 14 days. <laughs> Um, packaging in Africa or Asia, where it might say a better you at just a few shades away. Outside of the US, the number one beauty product is a whitening cream. And that it was particularly um, pushed in India and, and other countries. And it was really, yeah, it was shocking for me at the time. I really had not thought about and it's still shocking. It's still shocking. And and maybe that's partly my ignorance. Richly melanated skin is beautiful. And and yep. there's so much around. I think of like Bell Hooks, um, who her writing has been really uh, important to me and how important it is in her writing that that women determine their own relationship to beauty and what beauty means to them and seeing themselves as beautiful. And it's so multifaceted. There's our there's our sense of beauty, our sense of feeling beautiful and, and does that mean feeling attractive? And then what is the relationship to beauty industry? Cause that's a whole added element. Absolutely. I, you know, people won't acknowledge that there's black people in Egypt, uh, there's black people in Brazil, um, when people think of Australia, they don't want to think about the Aborigines. They rather just think of uh, the existing Australians now. And it's kind of just like, wow, from commercials to uh, beauty industries, to modeling um, agencies, to beauty pageants, um, to TV casted media roles. It's like there's ongoing underrepresentation of black people with the procedures. We've got now home treatments because obviously these procedures are too expensive to be uh, purchased. So then we have laser treatments ongoing, IV drips, capsules in the forms of soaps, moisturizers, lotions, creams, over-the-counter over steroids. Is I really would like to see a lot more outcry and organizing from white people about this issue. I, I think it's wrong that these brands that, that we know these corporations have long-standing histories. Some of these companies are like almost a hundred years old or more. Yeah. Johnson and Johnson, all this kind of stuff. Um, and you know, I, I still need to fact check some of that, but the reality is a lot of these are long-standing. And as I said before, they should be held accountable for, for pushing these products to people and for all of the physical and psychological implications that it has. Even, even falling within the scope of a European beauty standard that was being marketed as, as a standard of beauty, right? Even within it, I still was, I was scrutinizing the life out of myself and trying to change myself. And then 10 years later, thick eyebrows are in, right? So all of a sudden there's like a trend. And I start to notice as I've become a more aware adult, okay, these manipulations of women's features, something like eyebrows, that let's, even- Let's take it to the extreme. So what we see now, that used to be a, considered a curse. <laughs> we've got white women uh, in the tanning salon. We've got white women uh, with traditional African style braids or African-American style braids. 
we've got the lip injections and the the bottom injections and um even in fitness i follow a lot of like fitness apps and and there's more uh white women uh fitness folks who are very focused on growing their their leg muscles and growing their buns and things like that yeah. and that has a lot of historical implication that it's very problematic um there's a lot of complexity and i think the word trend is really the the painful piece south african uh woman uh she was known for having a really big backside and she was sexualized do you remember the name i believe are you talking about sarah bartlett yes that's the one um yeah that that story her story and she has another name that she goes by that i i would also like to pull up um but that story was uh made a, a very big impression on me in terms of understanding the the extent of the perversion of of european colonial antics and and behaviors at the time um that that not only were they abusing this woman and um make making a mockery of her in a lot of ways but then they also modeled a lot of their fashion based on her like curvature and her body and then we see it repeat itself in in some of the ways that these these trends operate so i remember we were saying something about how the patriarchy have an agenda to keep all women in mm -mm. Mm well women all over the globe are insecure and striving for perfection and it's mm. like almost like they no longer want to be who they are i'm just thinking like the impact what is the impact this has had on white women like mm. who want to do um who are content with how they look um and they are satisfied um but obviously seeing the reverse on the media that you know you're unattractive you don't have big lips a big backside mm -hmm. and now all women are trying to live up to the standard for years growing up you know having the stereotype like if you're black then you have to have like the big hair mm -hmm. da, 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 da. and that wasn't necessarily me so i remember at the time you know with what i that i wasn't fitting the the perfect stereotype all of a sudden and how that made me feel and obviously mm. right to that obviously the colorism I mean, I'm not light skinned. I don't have a straight nose. I don't have mm. straight hair. Um, you know, but obviously this was in fashion at the time. So growing up mm. in that kind of environment, I know that that had a devastating effect on my insecurities. That was my transition to really find myself. I fall in love with my melanin and the kinkiness of, and the tightness of my curls and my big nose um, and all the makeup, the genetical makeup that makes me me. Because it's like, okay, white women. You're, you're more attractive if you have black girl features. Black women, you're attractive with your features, but it suits you better on a white woman. So... <laughs> First of all, let's take a moment for how beautiful you are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I You made me think of when you're talking about stereotypes. I'm also thinking about, for sure, so these stereotypes that exist, um, that are fabricated, that are made up, um, often by, at, from a perspective of white supremacy mm. um, towards various ethnic groups, right? And lots of times these stereotypes function to undermine the power and beauty that various groups have. I, I learned this recently because I read a great book called The Color of Food by Natasha Bowens. And she talks about the use of watermelon as a racist stereotype. And what I learned was not only are watermelons indigenous to Africa and uh, came with black people, with African people and, and were spread around the world in that way, but also following emancipation in the U.S., farming and agriculture 
had been a major skill set and knowledge of African people. And so following emancipation, farming, harvesting crops, particularly watermelon, was one way for Black, people, Black Americans to gain economic freedom. And so this stereotype where it was uh, the image was used to as a negative was to actually try to undermine and upset the growing economy of Black people in emancipation and free Black people. So I say all that because I think these stereotypes, sometimes people uh, try to shrug them off, shrug them off as um, meaningless or don't, you know, don't get your feelings hurt. It's just a joke or something like that. Furthermore, when we look at white appropriation of various features and, and hairstyles and um, clothing, we're also often looking at white stereotypical perception of those things, of, of that ethnic group. So lots of times that there's it's a hot mess. It's it's a distortion of uh, of someone's actual culture and presentation. It's a it's a based on a stereotype and then represented on a lot of in in this cultural appropriation and um, by a lot of white women specifically. They're not represented. And then there's also something I found really interesting, and actually wrote this down. So so this is what we're dealing with in today's society. Thin lips, seen as ugly. Big nose, seen as ugly. Straight hair, seen as preferable. Tight curls, almost Afro kinkiness, seen as unprofessional. Pale skin, mm. seen as okay, but not too much. Dark skin, seen as too much, none at all. And then we have tanned olive skin, which is just right. Mm -hmm. And then I just think to myself, is mixed race mm -hmm. a new promotion? I know, because I know white supremacy will never die out but having something which is black, but not too black, mm. that speaks for itself. Some of the language I've heard around that for sure is like anti-blackness um, and and how that, yeah, absolutely. That there's, there is still, we're still not getting the representation, the engagement with the uplifting of richly melanated people, absolutely. Because you were saying before, mm -hmm. like, you know, you would rather see white women or white people um, take up a stance on it. But one thing I've learned about life is if it's not affecting you, why should you bother yourself? Why should you get involved? I hear it. Um, and I, I don't, it's still, you know, I've not been to, I've not been to Africa. I really hope to go one day very soon. Um, I've not been to India. I can imagine and I've seen some of the marketing that goes on. I'm thinking about how the entitlement that comes with, with whiteness, particularly in the US is where I'm at. I mean, it's global. <laughs> um, but the entitlement and the, um, the, alongside these companies, the creation of trend and how offensive that is and, and how disrespectful and racist. Um, and I'm thinking about how lots of times that I'm, you know, when I talk about a lot of this appropriation, I'm looking at white women because that's that's where the beauty industry overlaps with them, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking about their entitlement to access to to um, you know, we're talking about where where does it come from now that there's this shift in in these in the the beauty norms or um, you know, you were reading off to me about what was considered attractive or not attractive and um, access that they want to various ethnic groups, culture, appearance, mm -hmm. fashion, um, but without supporting those actual people and lots of times without having any proximity to them. When we talk, you know, friendship, community, anything like that. And so there's a taking, there's a taking and there's, there's no uplifting. And so that's where th there's no allyship for lack of a better word and, and things like that. So that's where I get very upset with the accountability piece of these companies and also of individual white people um, to be introspective about why it is they want to access and um, present 
in those ways. And then why it is that they're also not learning, educating themselves at all about the experience of people that they're often appropriating the culture from. But there's a way in which if we're not aware of and mindful of the impact the beauty hat beauty industry has on many women. The intention becomes for us to be in competition to um, with, e- with each other. The intention becomes for us to be distracted with uh, perfecting or whatever that means, uh, aspects of our bodies and our faces and, and all this. And ultimately it, it prevents us from really unifying um, and, and examining these problematic issues, holding each other accountable, holding, holding white people accountable and undoing it. And can we just take a moment just to just acknowledge how beautiful Lindsay is. Thank you. It's, it's nice to give each other some love. That's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, I, I have a, um, a beautiful goddaughter who is just one of the the biggest blessings of my life. Um, and she's African American and, um, getting to spend the amount of time with her that I have in the, in her baby phase, pretty much from her first little day until she was five, um, that my experience with her and wanting to see her just shine and be herself and, and knowing how incredible she is in all these ways. Um, it's just given me a lot of awareness um, as to how important it is to counter these, these nar- narratives um, of negative connotation like we're discussing and to counter it and push back. And I always, you know, I make such a point with her and uh, just to remind her how beautiful she is and smart and recognize especially in that relationship, just, just how important it is, um, to, to be encouraging her, her sense of self and identifying herself as beautiful, as smart, as capable. Um, I, I love her so much. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and you see guys, this is why I had to get Lindsay on. Lindsay is one of those women where she's not just all talk, as you can see, she's all about making an impact raising awareness, being that advocate and standing up for what she truly believes in. I know your partner is extremely grateful um, to obviously have found a a woman as conscious as you are. Lindsay's partner is Guyanese. You can get with someone, you can have chemistry uh, with someone from a different race, but sometimes Mm -hmm. it doesn't always work out because you realize that they, this person doesn't share my morals. They don't get it. They don't understand. And they're not willing to. It's, it's literally just decency to to unlearn and to move through the world in a way where you support people and you see things justly and equitably and i still you know it's a every day for me and you know my my i'm so grateful to my partner um for the the honesty um and the the ability to show up as ourselves and to and for me to be held accountable in in a lot of ways you know like you said before sometimes when people don't perceive that something affects them then they're not really willing to get involved or so but the reality is walking around with these misconceptions with these ignorances with these with these biases that Great, affects everyone. <laughs> that affects everyone certainly it's affecting certain groups uh more violently yes and also it's it's a trap that a lot of white people put themselves in with that with limited and narrow thinking and stereotypical thinking um it's it's harmful to them as well and i i i hope it'll be the case that 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 becomes more of a recognition and that more white people uh make it their business to unlearn and undo look i'm i support women like if you want to be out there with with your goodies out do you think right like i'm not um i'm not here to judge anybody um and and you know what is it how how do we also have to be mindful of 
what we internalize as beautiful, as attractive, as how we, what we need to aspire to. Right. And sometimes there's really positive affirming images, right? Um, a lot, in fact. And then also I'm just saying to be mindful that we can still be exposed to a, to a lot of images that can, that can fuel self-criticism for women or even uh, perpetuate those European beauty norms. You know, I think that on the one hand, you also have a lot of uh, fetishizing that comes from white people towards people of color, towards black people. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, yeah. And, and those, those types of behaviors are, um, apparent. And if you might, if, if a white person is, uh, saying that they're interested in dating, you know, a person of this ethnic background, I think that's really problematic. You know, I, I think that there can be for sure, genuine love and connection across uh, these racial boundaries, which on the one hand are sort of are invented and then on the other hand are very, very much a social reality. Um, and then I also support people who who want to build and love um, within their community. So and specifically talking about uh, black love. When I say I would love to reincarnate with you. Mika, if we're reincarnating like that, then certainly I'm trying to come back with with your views and your morals and your beauty 100%. All right, well, we put it out into the universe. Um, Lindsay, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed myself. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation just as much as I've enjoyed talking to Lindsay. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you so much. And thank you for the honesty and the vulnerability and... Um, it's been so cool to connect with you really, really. Yeah, likewise. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've really enjoyed and learned a thing or two as I have. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the very next video. Apart from that, I wish you a very good evening, morning, wherever you are in this world. Peace, love, and all of the above. Me and Lindsay are out. Peace.